Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Judith Haas. I'm a member of the English department, and I'm also the director of the search program at Rhodes. Um, and I want to welcome you and thank you very much for coming out to this Communities in Conversation lecture in celebration of the 200th anniversary. Uh, try it that way. In celebration of the 200th anniversary of the publication of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, so I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of this event, Jonathan Judakin, the Spence Wilson Chair in the Humanities, Leslie Petty and the English Department, Sarah Boyle in the Environmental Studies Program, Rhiannon Graybill in the Gender and Sexuality Studies Program, the Rhodes Lecture Board, and the Search Program. I would also like to thank Jackie Baker and Christy Waldkirk for making the most important things happen so smoothly. Also, thank you to Jordana Terrell and Lily Flores, who will be helping with the Q&A after the lecture. There will be a Q&A after the lecture. Um, and students in the audience, you should know that there is swag available for you if you ask a question. I think it might be a t-shirt, but I'm not sure. Yes, a t-shirt, okay. I don't know if there's any like other kind of jewelry or anything like that, but I think it's at least a t-shirt. Uh, one thing I will say before I forget, um, please turn off your cell phones or turn them to airplane mode or whatever you need to do um, before we get going. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Claire Colebrook. Um, she is the Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of English, Philosophy, and Women's and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Penn State University. She did her undergraduate work at the University of Melbourne and her PhD at the University of Edinburgh. And as that list of departments claiming her makes clear, it's not easy to come up with a fitting discipline-specific term that captures what kind of scholar Claire Colebrook is. Philosopher, feminist theorist, political theorist, literary critic, to, main, to name a few. Professor Colebrook has been on the forefront of feminist scholarship on the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, and she has an amazing breadth of engagement with continental philosophy in every way. She has written on the canonical figures of English literature, John Milton, William Blake, Mary Shelley, as well as contemporary post-apocalyptic fiction from Cormac McCarthy's The Road to Margaret Atwood's After the Flood. She definitely has something to say about cyborgs and zombies and all the other figures that populate our fantasies of the end of the world. And in response to these fantasies of the end, Professor Colebrook insistently asks whose world exactly is ending. I will just mention a few of Professor Colebrook's most recent published works selected from a prodigiously long list, so long that once I got to item number 60 of her published titles on the MLA, um, MLA listing, I just got too tired to go further. Um, so Professor Colebrook is perhaps most famously associated with her recent work in the area of Anthropocene studies and critical climate change. In 2014, she published a two-volume set of essays on the concept of extinction, uh, death of the posthuman, and sex after life. She is currently working on fragility in relation to anthropogenic, the anthropogenic impact on the planet. One of her most recent works is an essay titled Lives Worth Living, Extinction Persons, Persons Disability in a collection of essays called After Extinction that just, just came out this year from the University of Minnesota Press. I am so very pleased to have Professor Colebrook here at Rhodes College. I've long admired her work for its combination of playfulness and relentless rigor. Her thought ranges everywhere, including and most pointedly, pointedly to those seeming impasses where to think further is to risk everything that makes thinking possible. She is here today to talk about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and I can't think of anyone better to weigh in on the richness and multiplicity of that novel. So please join me in welcoming Claire Colbrook. Um, thanks very much for inviting me here. Um, I just want to advertise the swag. I didn't even ask a question. And I got this, I think it's rather, I think it's worth a question, right? So um, I'm reading out from a written version of the text 
and um, it's quite dense, so I'm going to skip over passages. So this is um, just my way of saying uh, the questions um, can just be asking me to explain something that's um, possibly, probably less than clear. I'm just going to put this so I don't forget it. Swear. Just in case you take it away from me because I'm not going to be posing any questions. I'm just going to hopefully generate some. So what I want to do is um, talk about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein but in the um, context of climate change because um, it's 200 years since um, Mary Shelley um, wrote Frankenstein as a teenager. So those of you who are 18 and you haven't yet written your first novel, get a move on. <laughs> um, she wrote another, another, quite a few within the next 10 years as well. So maybe that's what a world without television gets you. <laughs> And wrote, write, write a few novels by the time you're 28. Anyway, I, it's uh, 200 years since Mary Shelley wrote um, Frankenstein. It's also about 20 years since the concept of the Anthropocene was also given its monstrous birth when um, Paul Crutzen proposed that um, not just climate change, so climate change might be something local, uh, like ocean acidification or deforestation, you change the climate. The Anthropocene is a much bigger, much more monstrous concept. Um, geologists propose that um, even if we were to all cease to exist tomorrow, if let's say there was a viral pandemic, the type that Mary Shelley wrote about in The Last Man, and let's say something came along and sliced the planet and looked and could see the Ice Age and could see fossils from dinosaurs, there'd be this layer where there was a massive amount of radiation, strange change in um, fossil and biomass. We'd see that instead of tigers and elephants, there were all these cats and dogs and pigs, right? Um, they'd see a completely different um, type of planet happened sometime, possibly around the time Mary Shelley was writing Frankenstein. One of the markers of the Anthropocene is the industrial era when we started, if we believe in climate change. Um, but let's just ex pretend we do for this hour, 45 minutes. Um, massive emissions of CO2, um, right about the time Frankenstein has been written. So what do I want to do is begin by putting these two things together. So both climate change in the Anthropocene and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein pose the question of what it is to be human. But they both of them do by facing in um, two directions. On the one hand, and this is, happens in Frankenstein, there's two quite distinct propositions about what it means to be human. One is um, if we take Victor seriously, being human is being driven by ambition, being, trying to, to discover the source of life, trying to get to the origin of light and life. The novel begins with Walton sailing to see the, the beginning and origin of life in the north. Um, he meets Frankenstein, he tells him his story of discovering the origin of life and the tragic outcome of that. So one sense is that humans are Promethean. Their will, their desire to conquer will ultimately be their undoing. That's also one way of reading the Anthropocene. We've destroyed the planet. Everything that contributed to civilization, everything that made civilization possible, um, including the lighting, the heat, the iPad that makes all this possible, will ultimately destroy the planet and all life. So it's this sort of tragic Promethean notion that the very things that make us great might also be our undoing. But one of the ways people have objected to the concept of the Anthropocene is to say it actually isn't humanity that destroyed the planet. It's a small group of humans, those who benefited from slavery and industrialization, who managed to develop techno-culture to the point where it could emit radiation, change the biomass, um, increase ocean acidification, 
a small portion of humanity that took itself to be humanity in general, that took itself to be exemplary, is exactly what uh, destroyed, the, destroyed the planet. So the anthropos is not humans as a species, but a certain portion of humanity that took itself to be the only possible um, form. And if we think about Frankenstein, the novel, um, Victor Frankenstein can only imagine one form of humanity. When he creates another form and it doesn't look like him, that's where the tragedy lies. So here's where I'm going to start talking about the novel in a little more detail. So both the Anthropocene and Shelley's Frankenstein face two directions, both concerned with what it means to be Promethean. What does it mean to overreach oneself, to try and be higher than oneself? Um, one is that it's destructive. Humans tried to change the planet and they did so to their own detriment. Victor tried to create human life and did so to his own tragic detriment. The other possibility is that uh, Prometheism, Promethe, Promethe, Prometheusism, um, is actually something that Shelley wants to go further. The problem isn't that Victor was too creative, but that actually he had a very limited imagination. When he saw that the monster didn't, the monster, shouldn't call it, the creature, uh, didn't look like himself, he stepped back in horror. He couldn't imagine any form of life that didn't look like his own. So Shelley's Frankenstein is what I would refer to as a genealogy or diagnosis of the human. Um, this is recognised by Victor. Once he, once he has created what he hoped to be a human of his own kind, he steps back from the possibility that what has turned out to be unlike him will replicate and proliferate. So the very form of Frankenstein as a framed narrative, I really want to stress that, is um, situates stories in the context of the de desire to be recognised and replicated. So Walton is travelling... Um, he sees Victor and pretty much falls in love with him, right? So, at, because he sees a higher version of himself. So, the novel, before Victor even creates what he thinks is going to be a higher version of himself, before we even get to that point in the novel, all we see are mainly men trying to find doubles of themselves, trying to replicate themselves. Um, and we see them doing so both literally, like, oh, I've, I've fallen in love with Victor Frankenstein because he's just like me, only better. I want to create a monster that's just like me, only better. I want to have a family um, that mirrors, my, mirrors me back to myself. And we tell stories about that. Stories are ways of repeating and replicating oneself. I think Frankenstein is about a scientist who creates a creature but it's also about the way stories create that creature. If you, we all know that the creature learns language and becomes human by hearing a family read Paradise Lost and Volney's The Ruins. So you become human by copying, by repeating, by being replicated. So before Blade Runner, um, this was the first novel of replication. So before we even get to the point where Victor actually creates the monster, um, we've already come across several scenes of self-doubling and self-replication, including Victor's own family, where people are taken in from outside, taken up into the family, married, and become Victor's possession. Victor treats the girl that was his half-sister as his own, um, as his better half. In Frankenstein, families are already scenes of mirroring, ownership and increasing self-replication. But when Victor goes to university, that's also another scene of replication. The professors say, don't read this tradition, read this tradition, become like me. Universities are seen as monstrous scenes of people trying to recreate themselves. But there are other ways of reading and replicating in um, Frankenstein, the novel. There's, there's one scene um, where uh, Victor goes to university and all the professors want him to read and replicate the tradition that they're in. But then there's another way of reading, which is when the creature first emerges, all he sees is light, dark, 
sound, shape, warmth, cold. Um, instead of reading an inherited tradition, he sees the world um, as an orphan. So Mary Shelley forges a completely different way, I would argue, of thinking about human Prometheanism. The problem is not one of overreaching, of yearning to know too much, but instead of stopping short with reading. The problem isn't that Victor read, went to university and read too much science, is that he didn't read enough. He got enclosed in one tradition and then when he started to push it, he stepped back. The problem is not that Victor is a scientific Promethean, a man who asked and knew too much, but that he's not Promethean enough. All he wants to do is replicate his own family, his own version of humanity. His science opens the possibility that life might be otherwise, that it might take a non-familial and orphaned form. I really want to stress that the creature is born without a family, right, and he's open to the world, and he suddenly takes on notions of duty um, only by overhearing texts from the past. So this gives us two ways of thinking about Frankenstein in the Anthropocene. The first, we can adopt Victor's moral and humanity-saving narrative where science must know its limits and not overstep the place set for man in a seemingly ordered and familial universe. Science must only operate to save itself. That's one possibility. The second would be to take the framing of the novel seriously and see Victor from the point of view of his creature before the creature has been humanised, before he's overheard Paradise Lost and the Ruins. The scene where Victor and his creature first view each other is utterly inhuman. It's outside the orders of the family and polity and it's completely non-hierarchical. It's one in which neither creature has in any way any inscriptive grid for reading the other. At that stage, Victor is not yet the creature's father. It's only after he's heard a family um, reading texts from the past that he refers to Victor as his father, as something that owes him his happiness and that must create another version of him. So Shelley's Frankenstein reconfigures a moral Prometheism, reconfigures a moral, you think I'd have learned to pronounce this word before I step, Prometheanism, although I'm Australian and we don't pronounce anything properly, so I'm off the hook, right? Okay. Um, at least it doesn't have an R, R in it. Okay, so um, there, is, there is in what I would argue in current Anthropocene discourse an assumed moral Prometheanism. Humanity ought to have used science for its own survival and instead overstepped itself and is now destroying the planet, but it can save itself by returning to what it properly is. That's what I would refer to as the moral Prometheanism of the Anthropocene. Shelley, 200 years prior to that, is already creating a criticism of that idea of moral Prometheanism. Rather than lamenting the overreaching of humanity for being too imaginative, Frankenstein constantly criticises the ways in which when we look at humanity, we can only tolerate other versions of ourselves. And there's something radically um, hyper-Promethean or inhuman, uh, a form of inhuman Prometheanism when Frankenstein, the novel, poses the question that perhaps we might step beyond the family, beyond ourselves, and be radically orphaned, to see ourselves as outside humanity from the point of view of the creature. What is it to be orphaned from humanity? What is it to not be recognised by the Victor Frankensteins of the world who see the only task of humanity as one of domination and self-replication. So here's the question that's posed by the Anthropocene that I think is posed um, more artfully in Mary Shelley's novel. So here's what the, the Anthropocene presents us with as a moral, political question. Is the human, either at a species level or as a, or as a geological formation, a horrifically destructive force that has now reached its end. One 
conclusion we could make from the Anthropocene is that humans have destroyed the planet and therefore have no right to a future? Or is it time to recognise some other humanity that was erased in the path to that destruction? Is it time to recognise some drive that's been contained by a limited form of humanity, the familial form, maybe we can talk about what that is later, um, and has deflected us from another um, non-self-replicating future. So this is my one quotation that I'm going to read from the novel. It's when the creature has overheard the family um, reading Volney's The Ruins. This is the creature speaking. These wonderful narrations inspired me with strange feelings. Was man indeed at once so powerful, so virtuous and magnificent, yet so vicious and base? He appeared at one time a mere scion of the evil principle, and at another as all that can be conceived of as noble and godlike. To be a great and virtuous man appeared the highest honour that can befall, befall a sensitive being. To be base and vicious, as many on record have been, appeared the lowest degradation. A condition, this is the key phrase I'd like to pay attention to, a condition more abject than that of the blind mole or harmless worm. A condition more abject. What the creature sees when he looks at humanity from the outside is to see those in power, those who have destroyed and conquered and enslaved the planet as the abject. Now, there is something problematic in that, that Shelley, um, like Mary Wollstonecroft before her, thought that it was worse to be someone who enslaved someone than a slave, right? That if you, if you were a, an enslaver, you'd actually just turned yourself to nothing more than a blind mole or worm, right? Um, there's problematic, because I think it probably was worse to be a slave, um, and she probably hadn't thought that one quite through. But there is an interesting, there is an interesting uh, idea in the monster looking outside at humanity and seeing empire as a form of abjection, as a form of self-destruction. Um, in this respect, so I want to start exploring two ways about reading Mary Shelley, two ways about thinking the romanticism of her time, and two ways of thinking about the present two ways. Because I think the Anthropocene, as an event that we're all living in, puts us at a crossroads. We can see that humanity has been destructive. The planet, just passive voice, the planet has been destroyed. It's not the same as it was. Um, does that mean there's something rotten at the heart of humanity? that one might be able to look at from the outside? Or does that allow us to think about another uh, non-anthropocene humanity that, that couldn't be seen up until this point? Okay, so two ways. Two ways of reading Frankenstein. One is the moral reading. This is, a, this is about a scientist who thought too much and imagined too much and came to a tragic end. That's the moral reading. The other reading is to say, um, actually, it was Victor himself who was being too moral, too um, enclosed within a narrow vision of familial humanity and couldn't see the monster as offering another possibility of life. So in this respect, one might start to think about two ways of reading Romanticism, Mary Shelley, the Anthropocene, and our present. The first would be to see our current Anthropocenic so that's my new um, adjective, anthropocenic. That's where we are. Um, our anthropocenic relation to nature, our mournful relation to nature, which is, look, we messed up, um, as an extension of what, what began in Romanticism, as 
a world that was critical of humanity in its imaginative, willful, creative manner. Um, so one way of reading our present is we, we tried too hard. We tried to create a greater planet. We failed and now we're living in the tragic ruins. Victor tried. Um, he tried too hard. He imagined too much and now he's suffering. But another way to read Frankenstein is to, be, to see it as critical of this mournful relationship towards humanity and, and not be in a condition of self-loss. Look, we've destroyed ourselves. We're in our final days. Um, how can we live on knowing that we destroyed the planet? Um, one way is to read, this, read Mary Shelley's um, Frankenstein by contrasting Victor Frankenstein's conception of life, um, nature and humanity. So we, instead of reading it from Victor's point of view, read it from the creature's point of view. Let's start to look at the way both of them have a philosophy of nature, Victor versus the monster. Victor composes his creature from component parts. I mean, that much we know. It's, we don't actually have a blueprint from the novel that would help us to go out and do it again doesn't give us that much detail, but it does let us know that it's part assemblage of parts and then the injection of energy into the assemblage of parts. So Victor composes his creature from component parts and imagines natural objects as the outcome of some type of putting together plus life, right? You put things together and then you use electricity to give them life, um, sort of like having a an appliance and plugging it in, as though here's bodies, here's life, put them together, hey presto. So prior to that moment, we've seen Victor buried in books as though the present life and humanity could be gained by knowledge, by just reading the instruction manual one more time. He cuts himself off from the openness of nature and becomes a lone craftsman following the manual. Whereas the creature, by contrast, begins not by putting things together to compose something that's connected, but by seeing the differences. Um, when the creature opens his eyes, he sees light, dark, cold, heat, um, wet, warm. He moves around and instead of seeing things connected, he sees them in their differences. Instead of trying to put things together to assemble an organised whole, uh, he's, he's able to perceive the differences of the world and he's not yet um, blessed with language. Um, first words he uses are fire, Promethean, you know, like how to conquer. Um, so it's not just um, the monster or the creature, but also Clerval, who look at nature with a more open eye. So one might read Frankenstein as a proto-Anthropocene cautionary and moral tale, against a Prometheanism that aims to see nature as no more than matter to be manipulated according to a limited conception of, human, of the human. There's another humanity that's suggested in the figure of the creature a humanity that can be open to a future that doesn't actually already have something that looks like himself, we think, that imagines, recognises and includes other modes of existence. This opposition between um, Promethean humanity, one that can only see the future in a version of itself, and a sort of hyper-Promethean um, humanity that can imagine other versions of itself, is not something that um, only exists in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I'm gonna, this is the, un, the second of the two quotations I'm gonna read. This is from a current um, earth scientist, earth scientist called Clive Hamilton, who's written books on the Anthropocene. This is from his book, Earth Masters. And he diagnoses the present by referring both to Prometheanism and Romanticism. He's a hardcore scientist. He's not a literature student. Um, he's an Australian um, Earth system scientist. But this is his um, take on the present. Prometheans rule. Over three centuries of advance, displaced workers, romantic poets, he's using that word dismissively, romantic poets, dismayed clerics, 
and far-seeing ecologists put up resistance, all sooner or later were crushed. Who can hold back such a force? Yet history proves that the invincible can be thwarted and the mighty brought to heel in unexpected ways. As the Chinese proverb has it, when taken to their extreme, things revert to their opposite. Only history can answer whether the time has come, but if the meek are ever to inherit the earth, then they had better be quick. And then he says we should be Soterians rather than Prometheans. So, um, Soterians are meek. They hope to inherit the earth, not master the earth. Now, one way of um, tying that text into both Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and the present is to see um, Frankenstein as a sort of 200-year-old um, anticipation of this notion that Prometheans rule, that we've won and what we need is a more modest um, attitude to the future because only then will we survive. But I want to suggest... OK, so this is where I'm getting towards some sort of conclusion. I want to suggest that rather than be um, anthropocenic, what do I mean by anthropocenic? Anthropocenic is what Victor is, it's what Clive Hamilton is. Anthropocenic is to look at humanity from on high and judge its failure and then demand that we be otherwise in order to have a future. So this is why um, Victor's last gesture in life is to kill his own creation, to destroy his own discovery because the science that he's embarked upon, he sees as destructive. Why? Because it doesn't create something that replicates him. That is what I see as anthropocenic. After destruction, thinking that having created a destructive force elevates one above the scene of wreckage. You know, I created this mess, therefore I'm the only one who can save it. Um, I looked into the darkness of life and I can now see a greater future where we become properly human again. That anthropocenic imagination dominates a lot of contemporary climate discourse. It's only now that we've destroyed the planet that we can recognise our proper humanity, save ourselves and move on. Um, such ways of reading um, or thinking about the Anthropocene um, might be mirrored in one part of Frankenstein. And for those of you who aren't very familiar with Paradise Lost, I'll just spend a brief moment talking about that. So the scene in which the creature confronts Victor and says, uh, you made me, you owe me existence, and what's more, you should create a female creature because the only way I can live is to have something of my own kind. So already the creature's absorbed this notion from other humans that one, one can only live in one's own kind. That mirrors a scene in Milton's Paradise Lost where Adam says to God, it's a really radical moment in Paradise Lost, Adam says to God, yes, I'll admit that I failed, but I never asked to be born, and you created me, and you didn't create me with enough strength to be the person that could survive the world you gave me. And in Paradise Lost, Milton's God says, it's true, I'll grant you, your life is pretty terrible now. But if you could see the future where you get to flourish and go to heaven, you'd just shut up. And, and, and Adam says, oh, OK, well, if, you, if I'd known there was going to be heaven and the New Testament, right, um, I wouldn't have complained about being human, right? I wouldn't have complained about being human. So Milton, that is what Milton uh, calls theodicy, justifying right, our existence. It looks like our existence is unholy. It looks like it can't be justified. But if we thought we were going to heaven, yeah, it's okay, right? Everything comes out in the wash if we get the afterlife. But Victor isn't able to say that to his creature. He isn't able to say, I'll grant you, I created you, 
I created you not fit to fit into this world. I'm not going to give you the wherewithal to fit in this world. But he hasn't got a hereafter. So what I think Mary Shelley, if Milton was writing a theodicy justifying God, right? How, could we, how can we explain the world as it is if there's God? Well, there's heaven, so suddenly all the wreckage of history um, isn't so bad if we have an eternity of um, beatitude. But Victor can't give that, mo- that, that answer to his creature. And so what I think Mary Shelley is doing, which is what I think our present is doing, is not theodicy justifying God. Now I'm going to make up another word. Anthropodicy, justifying being human. How can we justify being human? If, if the human is as destructive and barbaric as the creature seems to think from overhearing Milton, Volney, how can it have a future? If we think of Frankenstein as a theodicy after Milton's Paradise Lost, it's possible to see Shelley as refusing the notion that this life will be redeemed by another paradise. The creature's demand of his creator that having been brought into life, he is owed life with others, seems to provide an ethical contrast with with the scientist Victor's self-enclosure. To justify this life does not require looking ahead to a later and higher form of existence, but only looking without. Uh, All the creature wants in the beginning is to be able to see and live and hear, speak, touch, feel with others. Uh, The creature isn't concerned that the family that he's hijacking, (laughs) um, living next door to, He's not concerned that they're not like him. He just wants to be like them. It seems that Promethean, Prometheanism is countered by a tempered humanity. The monster comes into being, at least in part, by overhearing familial life and hearing Milton's Paradise Lost and Volney's room, Ruins of Empire being read aloud by the family he comes to love and eventually approach and eventually be um, refused. Entry to. Theodicy becomes an ever more urgent question from the 17th century to the present. As we look back at the panorama of history and see so much wreckage, it's hard to justify the ongoing existence of humanity. In modernity, without the promise of an afterlife, redemption needs to be found here and now, primarily by identifying a history in which, however bad humanity has been in its past, we can explain how it might become otherwise. This is not only a theme in Shelley's Frankenstein and her other novel, The Last Man, it's the theme of every post-apocalyptic film we see in the cinema today. It's the world's about to end because we messed up, but someone, usually a retired American astronaut, um, will be there to save the day, right? Um, And it's humanity as a whole is threatened, but some little fragment of an America that we've forgotten will redeem the future, whether it's like Will Smith or Matthew McConaughey, but someone who was given a you know, raw hand um, but is lying just in wait to, br- to bring humanity into the future. So there must be some evil fragment of humanity, capitalism, colonialism, corporations, nuclear industries, let's call it Prometheanism, from which humanity proper can detach itself. From theodicy, asking how we can be so barbarous if God is good, we've shifted to anthropodicy, human justification. How can humans justify their existence in a history of violence? The answer is often, seemingly, that it is Prometheanism that has robbed us of our better selves and the earth. This seems to be how humanity questions itself, its relation to nature and its right to a future in Frankenstein, but I want to say it's not so. What Victor sees as monstrous and unworthy of life, a creature who appears disfigures, seems to provide another hyper-Promethean humanity, something that can imagine a future without replication and without something that's exactly like itself. The creature, like Milton's Adam, asks the question of the right to life. If Milton's Adam can declare that God created terms that were too hard, only to be countered by the notion of a heaven he cannot yet imagine, 
Victor's monstrous creature cannot be so easily assuaged. Instead, Victor's creation of a dependent being without giving any thought to that being's own mode of existence seems all too eerily to preempt today's Earth masters. The very forces that reconfigured the Earth, creating more and more beings, like Victor's creature, who no longer have the means or right to life, seem to be mark embarking on exactly the same post-Promethean strategies. It's true we created this industrial um, paradise for ourselves, but we realise we've messed up, so therefore you can't have it. That's the present, right? We created this, it's awesome for us, but look at you, who we also created. We can't give you those same privileges. We've got to go back now because the planet's at stake. So, conclusion. I want to suggest that despite first appearances, Mary Shelley's novel isn't an anti-Promethean humanist morality tale, but is instead an anti-humanist and hyper-Promethean story about the potentials of speculative overreaching. It wasn't that Victor had this crazy Frankensteinian imagination. He wasn't Frankensteinian enough. He hadn't read Frankenstein. The creature is humanised in two distinct phases, one in which he's nothing more than the sensations that are not yet formed into objects, and the second in which he overhears a familial and literary life that he yearns to join. It's that second phase that allows the monster... He doesn't know he's an orphan until he's been situated alongside a family. He doesn't know that he has a creator until, until he's told he is. He doesn't know concepts of duty until he learns them. Um, I just my iPad just skips. Um, this is where I'm talking about the end of um, Frankenstein. So it might seem if we take the moral reading, if you look at the end of Frankenstein, the creature repeats what he first hears when he's uh, overhearing Volney's The Ruins, that yes, um, he's caused suffering, yes, he's caused suffering, but that's nothing compared to the suffering of one who causes suffering, except by the time he's got to the end of the story, it's now reversed. The, the profound objection comes from the orphans and the unrecognised of this world who have to destroy themselves because they realise the suffering they're causing. That's the end of Frankenstein. I'm going to go off and kill myself because I just realise that my very existence is a cause of suffering. And yet, I want to say that there's a different way to read the ending of the novel. Shelley's ends of all her novels are always beginnings. They're always beginnings. The end of the world is the beginning of our world it's in The Last Man. Just as the creature in his orphaned and unworldly mode can only see light and shade and feel heat and warmth and not yet subjected to a sense of his own inhumanity, Shelley's novel's endings are always closer to the end of Paradise Lost where Adam and Eve are cast out of Eden but the world is all before them. No, it's not a bad... Milton's Paradise Lost actually has a happy ending which is being cast out of Eden. You have the world before you. Having observed the rise and fall of familial Prometheanism, Shelley's narrators, including the creature, demonstrate an orphaned and promising hyper-Prometheism that's open to a world that is not quite a new world. It, doesn't, it isn't achieved by displacing others and replicating oneself. Frankenstein ends with the creature bewailing the torment he has caused for humanity. His perceived monstru monstrousness causing a suffering surpassed what, by what it is to be monstrous. So I'm going to read the actual end of the novel and point out where I think there's a double reading. So this is the final paragraph. But soon he cried with sad and solemn enthusiasm, I shall die and what I now feel be no longer felt. So it ends with this end of feeling, not heaven, not an afterlife. Soon these burning miseries will be extinct. Ends with a thought of one's own non-being. I shall ascend my funeral pile triumphantly and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. The light of that conflagration will fade away. My ashes will be swept into the sea by the winds. 
My spirit will sleep in peace, or if it thinks, it will, sure, it will not surely think thus, farewell. So if it thinks, it won't be thinking this. So it looks like this is a suicide mission. But then there's one more sentence. He sprang from the cabin window as he said this, upon the ice raft which lay close to the vessel. He was soon borne away by the waves and lost in darkness and distance. We actually don't know if the funeral pyre was ever built <laughs> or whether he actually did bring about his own non-existence. <laughs> right? So there's a, a double. One is willing the end of the will, right? But the other is we see that said and yet we keep stepping on, we keep moving on. So just my, conc my concluding thought. Um, I'm suggesting that instead of reading Frankenstein as a moral tale that can tell us about how we overstepped our bounds in the present, it's actually a moral tale or an amoral tale or an inhuman tale about how we had too many bounds in the present, how the only future we could imagine for humanity was one in which we created beings that looked just like ourselves. Thank you. Come on, there's a free T-shirt. Hi, thank you. Song? No. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering uh, if you could say a little bit more about uh, the family um, as a site um, of for the for the reproduction uh, right. of a certain picture or form of, of humanity. Yeah, that's okay. So because I kept saying non-familial, familial, non-familial, familial. So um, part of the reason why I spoke this way about Frankenstein is because I've been thinking a lot about, this is just not an answer to your question, but just an explanation. I've been reading, thinking and reading a lot about Shelley's other novel, The Last Man, which also begins with a family. But now I'll just stick to um, Frankenstein. It, it, even before we get to the family, right, before we get to the family, um, the novel begins with Walton writing to his sister. Right, so it's a brother-sister relationship in which the brother is venturing out but also shielding his family from the horrors of venturing out, if that makes any sense. So he's got this cautionary tale to tell. I'm going into the light, right, and the origin of life. But I'm sending it back to my sister, right, it can't be his brother. It has to be someone back home, I think it can't be can't be his brother, right? Because there's a notion that the sister that's back at home is fragile and, and life-worthy and safe and not put at risk by the journeys that are taken, right? So you always have the horror of stepping outside the bounds of humanity is you put your family at risk, right? Um, that's... And um, how does the, how is uh, Victor terrorised by threatening all the science, all he did at university, comes back to destroy his family, right? And then when you look at the shape his family takes, it's that um, anything that is deemed to be, well, there's two, two scenes of families adopting children from the outside, right, and making them just like us. One is um, Victor's parents taking in the sister, right, but, and, and adopting her and then bringing her up as one of their own, right, which looks 
benevolent, but I think there's a, a I was, I've always tried to avoid the word sinister because I have a friend who's left-handed who finds it offensive, right? But I'll just sinister. Um, notion that all you, when you see another being that's fragile and exposed to the world, you just bring it in and then bring it up and marry it off to your son, right, to create more of yourself. The other scene is when uh, the creature is overhearing the family read aloud and they've taken in an Arab girl. Right? And what are they going to do? Read Paradise, like, she's presumably Christian, right? But it's this notion of the family is a scene of self-replication, right? So before, before Victor even creates a being that, that he imagines to be a higher version of himself, Shelley's already depicted that that's what families do, right? They're just attempts to self-replicate. I don't want to, I'm not saying, I'm not saying all your fat. I mean, it's a certain image of the family, right? I'm not, I'm not anti-family. Some of my best friends come from families. <laughs> I'm just saying, this notion of the family as something where everyone starts to mirror and replicate themselves and where one looks upon the the women in the family as my prized possession, right? That's uh, so. But before and before we've even got to that, Walton has looked at Victor as a double of himself, right? So I think that when I say familial, I don't even mean it in the biological sense, right? That of looking at something as though it's of your kind, right? Just yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. You. You. That's soon to get the T-shirt. <laughs> Oh yeah. Totally. Okay, so that's a really good because I, I think um, before there's an implicit criticism. So that's a good, really good question. That um, I, it's a framed narration. We're not meant to take Victor Frankenstein at his word, is right. And we're certainly not meant to take Walton at his word. And the and what and you're suggesting, so your question is suggesting that Walton too is timid. He hears this moral tale and it's like, whoa, right? Not going, you know. And what is he doing? Writing back to his telling a morality morality tale to his sister. So he's a He's a sort of scientific managerialist, right? He sees stuff in the lab, but it shouldn't go back home, right? You've got to protect. But you're right. The very fact that he's seduced by Victor, right, that he sees this noble, tragic figure that went too far and completely buys the Victor Frankenstein party line, which, which I was suggesting it has been also bought by people who look back at the novel and see it as, if you do a a library search of Frankenstein, which I guess a lot of you have done, most of the, if you just do Frankenstein as an article search, most of the articles will not be in the humanities. They will come from science journals about um, unethical experiments, right? So um, if, you do, if, you, if you do Frankenstein in bioethics, it's always about the Frankenstein, it's assumed that Frankenstein refers to unethical experiments, right? And I'm suggesting, yeah, he's not experimental enough and certainly not Walton, right? Walton just accepts the morality tale that Victor has told him. So, yes, thank you for that. Yes, my friend at the back. Yeah, yeah, um, at the end of the book, I agree with the point you're making, but I think in some ways the end, the end of the book shows that the monster is the most human of all the main characters. Victor's sure. not a nice person. No. He's an obsessive compulsive. He studies arcane, really almost forbidden stuff. Yeah. Goes to school, insists on doing this, and then steal body parts, sews them together, and warms up a monster. And the monster, the so-called monster, yeah. is a tabula rasa. And he, he enters into the world knowing nothing. He causes all this pain and suffering. Victor hunts him down. And there's, there's, a, there's a little book of medical witticisms called A Chance to Cut It, A Chance to Cure. And one of the lines in it is, what does the surgeon do when he cuts off the wrong, uh, amputates the wrong leg? Yeah. Sits down and stares at his navel. Well, that's what the monster's been doing in the, in the Arctic. Yeah. He's been contemplating what he did. He realized, my God, look at the pain and suffering I've caused. The monster has more humanity and more empathy in his little finger than Victor does. Sure, but that, 
I agree. So that reminds me of, um, I understand that Frankenstein is a book that's set on the values course, search, search for values course. I, I've had to teach way back, like decades ago, um, and one of the questions, I wonder if you've ever had this question, uh, Victor is the true monster, monster in Frankenstein, discuss, right? Okay, but see, I want to, uh, so that's the, you know, that's, sure, but except, here's what I want to question. Sure. He, but I, okay, so I'm saying she, I, my reading is that she wants, to, wants us to be uncreeped. Right, that there's. I think there's two things I want to say to that. First is when we when you say the monster is more human, right? Meaning more compassionate, right? More um, sympathetic, more empathetic, more yearning for others. What the novel shows you, and what the novel, what the creature listening to the family has learned is. Actually, to say it's human to be compassionate, empathetic and um, yearning for the benevolence and well-being of others is actually not human at all. He's heard the history of humanity, right? He says it's half human, right? So I think part of what the, part of what the novel is doing is saying to call these things human is to actually be very sloppy. Hu Sure. <laughs> yeah. What you said. <laughs> yeah, up the back. Thank you. So. Are you going to continue the stew metaphor? No, no. Okay. Really, I'm ready to move on. Um, it's just, it, yeah, okay. I can hear you. So. Okay. Perfect. So, um, as like. Uh, as modern biology has shown us and anthropology has shown us that there's been several human species throughout yeah. ever. And um, one of the things that I find really interesting is that it was our species that pushed the other species to extinction. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you had any opinions on whether or not this would be something like Mary Shelley would have predicted if she had known this kind of thing. It's Okay, so I think the first... I'm just going to, I'm going to answer that in two parts, right? Um, the first is, I, I don't have insight into my, everything I hypothesise is on the basis of what you've read, right? Which is, we've got the same text before us, right? But I think there's, no, there's clearly an indication that she's posing at least the possibility that something that's not of our species, right, um, isn't, is worthy of life, right? She's, she's posing that it's, I mean, uh, you know, there's many ways to read this text, but one, but one overwhelming possibility, right, is that there's nothing prima facie wrong with that being, right? That's Victor's problem. So short answer to your question, that part, this is clearly posing what if, right? So she's not, it's clear that this novel is not saying that the form of humanity that we've known up till now is the only um, justifiable form. Okay, first thing. The Last Man, she writes a novel a decade later about viral pandemic, it only wipes out humans. And you see all the animals beginning to flourish, uh, 
take over buildings, they're not actually eating each other, it's not a mad frenzy, it's like this almost Edenic, right? He's wandering around and there's just animals everywhere. Um, no, you don't see anyone eating animals, right? In the So what looks like, so for her, in The Last Man, the end of the world, is actually almost a utopia, right? Because there's a human and lots of animals. But you could look at, you could look at um, Frankenstein as a thwarted utopia, right? There's the possibility of another species that hasn't known empire, right? That isn't as messed up, right? Um, and yet, and, and is thwarted, right? So your question, humans, you know, a certain mode of existing has precipitated a lot of extinction, right? This is a part of thought experiment as a certain mode is doing exactly what you said, a sort of mode of, exi of existing creates an extinction. The word used at the end is extinct, not dead, because there's only one of him, right? So, um, yes, I think it's... There's definitely the possibility posed of another form of existence that's not our own that is as justifiable. Right. Yes, thank you. My... Yeah. My question sort of expands on that. I, I have kind of oh, a two, two, two parts to yeah. it. I understood your critique about the Promethean um, seeing the novel from Victor, Victor uh, Frankenstein's perspective and this, seeing it as a kind of moral tragedy about what it is that we've done to the world and yeah. accepting our limits. But I'm, I would, can you just expand a little bit more on your hypo-Promethean sensibility? Right but explicitly to talk about what is the role of human animals within that, if that's a way of understanding whatever our relationship is to the, cre the orphaned creature. Yeah. And then the, the second part, and maybe this will take you down that road, or maybe these are two completely different questions. At one point, you talked about reading this novel almost as a kind of um, precursor to Blade Runner. Yes. And that one of the ways to understand the creature is automatons that are yeah. created. So can you elaborate on okay. that thread that you never discussed? Sure. Yeah. So um, first bit about um, the hype, hyper hypo Prometheanism. The, I, I, the, the dominant motif in the Anthropocene, and I don't just mean it in there's now like five journals of Anthropocene studies, right? Um, but it's also a burgeoning film industry of we're about to face the end of the planet because of what we've done, right? But there is this um, hitherto not yet flourishing portion of humanity that will save us, right? So what I refer to as the Anthropocenic, right, is going through a journey of destruction, right, you recognise the force of humanity but its tragic capacity to do harm and that gives you the authority, the power, the duty to save what's left, right? So the classic um, motif, I just want to say I'm not anti-American I applied for my immigration status, right? So um, please don't record this and send it to, right? I'm not anti-American <laughs> but, but... There's normally this notion in post-apocalyptic dramas of it's America that is at once, I'm thinking of Interstellar, but uh, Independence Day and so on, where it's America that's once, seen, or Avatar, right? It's America that's seen as military capitalism and so on, right? But also it's that same America that is going to emerge and save the world from itself. And what you see of the rest of the world is just faceless hordes of suffering people that America has at once created but is also going to save, right? So um, what I'm saying about that, it looks Promethean, like this notion of overreaching, but actually what's suggested, I think, in Frankenstein is that it's a very, very, it's not Promethean, it's not overstepping, it's completely trying to sustain what you've always been, save what you've al always been, right? And that um, there's a brief moment 
where what would have happened if, um, you know, the tale of destruction is Victor's incapacity to recognize a form to recognize a form of life other than himself, which was precipitated by him trying to create a form of life, right? So it's an, a notion of so the, the sort of timid, what I would call a timid Prometheanism, is trying to overreach yourself, but only insofar as it can be of another version of yourself, right? And so a lot of Anthropocene studies is very um, anti-science, either anti-science because it look at the mess it got us into or pro-science because if we've destroyed the planet, we can save it. And I'm, I'm trying to say there's something other than that, right? Um, which is a form of science that is um, perhaps, going back to your notion of Walt, Walton turning back, Walton isn't going to create life. He just wants to look at light, right? The, the light. And then suddenly it gets drawn back into a drama of human self-creation when he meets Victor. And I think there's a, there's like, it's not a pro or anti-science or a pro or anti-technology. It's a pro, it's an anti, uh, what is it called? Techno-science, right? Or, or scientific managerialism, that a science that can only save us. Second bit about like the, the all too uh, cheap and ungrounded reference to um, Blade Runner, right? But, but in the back of my mind is the complete um, cowardice of Blade Runner 2049, right? Where there are replicants that, that suddenly they're worth saving because they can give birth the way humans give birth, right? And so what makes them worthy and poignant is that they're capable of human-like self-replication, right? And maybe something that's replicated that doesn't replicate itself, right? Uh, which is, I think, the original Blade Runner motif, right? Is uh, another just maybe there are justifiable forms of existence that don't have these heavy burdens of inheritance, right? I don't know if that's a long answer to a shorter question. Or Um, I find what you're talking about really, really interesting. Um, and I understand when you're talking about replication, how that relates to Frankenstein. Um, but I'm wondering how that fits with like humanity and the industrialization that you briefly talked about, because yeah. I feel like, um, for Frankenstein creating a creature, he's replicating himself, but he, but for humanity and industrialization, um, what exactly are we replicating yeah, when we industrialize. So, um, I'll start very simple and maybe try and get it more concise. Um, because you're right, it's, it's easy just to word, oh, we're replicating ourselves, well, we're not in, not in exactly the same way. But when we talk about the end of the world, right, and there's many, many dramas about the end of the world, it's not the end of the world. It's the end of a world that looks like the one that we're currently inhabiting, right? So um, I defy you to think of any... So first, I would say every film you go to the cinema to see now is about the end of the world or the possible end of the world or the threatened end of the world, and it's not the end of the world. It's the end of Manhattan, usually, right? It's um, There's L.A. as well in... Uh, a few of them, right? Um, 2012 is the end of LA, right? And it's so, it's uh, the, why is that an answer to your question? Because when we're talking about saving the world, saving the future, saving, the great one is saving the planet. Right? We're not talking about saving the planet, we're talking about saving the ways in which we have been living on the planet, right? That's what we're really talking about. If we, you know, drive a Prius, right, if we recycle, if we use a little less, we'll be able to save the planet. No, we're going to save what we are, right? So you're right, it was maybe a little quick and a little lazy to just say, oh, replication, replication. But if you look at sustainability, surviving, saving, right, it's, it doesn't have any notion that maybe there's another form of existence, right, that is 
not inhuman or <laughs> not unthinkable to... Um, um, sorry about the double negatives. And that often the scenes that look like the end of the world, right, are precisely what is already going on in a lot of parts of the world, right? They're places where there's no um, capitalism in, in the form that we enjoy it, right? There's no department stores, there's no airports, there's no cars, there's no convenience stores, there's no nice heated buildings, and right? And it's the end of the world. No, it's not the end of the world. It's another world, right? So that um, my... My use of replication is not replicating is, yes, in Frankenstein, families are in part replication like biological lines, but they're, they're also about replicating ways of life, which is why I think it's interesting that there are two cases of non-biological family members that are brought in from outside and then are just made the same, right? They're taken in from elsewhere and you become one of us, right? Um, in a, in a notion that I think in Mary Shelley's time is the only way you can relate to the rest of the world or elsewhere is to include it and make it just like us, right? Which is not the only way one can relate compassionately to others, is to say, uh, yes, you're, it's, you have a right to exist because deep down I know you're just like me. Right, that's not the only way one can recognise. Well, right, recognition isn't the only form of granting existence. Maybe I have no sense of the sort of person you are. You don't look like me. I don't recognise you at all. I have no idea what your imagination is. Um, I don't even know if the, if the word human is really has any meaning. You're so different from me. But, yeah, you can exist. Right, that's what I think she's contemplating. So that's what I mean by non-replication. Yeah. yeah, to follow up, yeah. The fact that you're saying that um, the creature, like there's nothing wrong with the creature as a form of existence or a form yeah. of humanity. Um, and if we're not experimental enough with our environmental rhetoric, like what do you think that means for climate change and things like that? Okay, so... Um, first, I think, I think the, the concept of sustainability, right? has to be, if you read the concept of sustainability after Frankenstein, let's call it post-Frankenstein sustainability, one needs to question the extent to which we try and sustain what we already are and are terrified of creating something that might mean that life is completely different from what we currently have, right? So that's what I mean by being not experimental enough. So this is... Um, you know, it's an allegory, right, in part. There's not... I don't, think there's, I don't think there's a realist proposition, right, about what humans need to do is create another quasi-species, right, in order to save themselves. I don't think that's the proposition. But it, 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 what might be allegorically posed is what humans need to do is imagine something that's possibly not fully recognisable as human and, and then see, does it... If that human being looked at us <laughs> and looked at our history and saw that it was part barbarism, part success, right, that might give us a different attitude towards our own future. So that's what I mean by not being experimental enough. Victor just wants to sh shut it shut it down, nothing to be seen here, right? And then tells everyone else, don't go there, don't think about it. And that's why, going back to the first question, you know, write a letter back to your family um, so that nothing like that ever happens again, right? Yes. Um, how was the novel originally received by the readers in that time? And how is it received by readers today? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll start from how it's received by readers today. I think um, I think the framing. Okay, I would say both. I'm now sort of like thinking while I'm answering. I would say in both cases, the framing of the novel gets lost. Right. I think that anyone who 
who um, reads literature and framed narratives, right? There's two reasons why novels are written in framed narratives. One is um, for realism purposes. So I often think that, um, just to give a modern analogy, if anyone sees the first film, Cloverfield, it's about the end of the world, but in order to explain that the world ended, you had to say, well, there was a department, we found this Department of Defence video that witnessed the end of the world, right? So you have to somehow account for how this story gets told. So one, one way to see the framing is it's realist, right? How is the monster telling his story? How is Victor telling his story? I met this person, here's a, you know, the novel begins with a letter, right? So it actually begins with a document that's real, right? I'm telling a story that someone told me. That's one way to read why it's a framed narrative. Another, I think, is um, diagnostic, right? When you, if you read Frankenstein and you see Victor as the one who realises that he overstepped the mark and he tries to kill his creation, right? So um, you miss what Shelley is trying to do or what the novel is trying to do, which is alert us to a certain way of seeing the world, right? So by, by having various stories, the creature's story, um, there's also other little stories tucked in there, the family story, Justine, the servant, even tells her story. I said I'd be, you know, I just said I wanted to be guilty. I, you know, I said I was guilty because I wanted to go to heaven, right? The reason why you have all those voices is when we're reading it to see what happens when people tell stories, right? And when, when they tell stories to justify themselves and we see those stories that's flawed. I think both in Mary Shelley's own time and... Um, in the present, the complexity of the framing gets lost and instead we read it um, as a straightforward story about a scientist who overstepped his bounds we read it as a story of evil genius, right? a tragic story of overreaching when you look at the current non-specialist literature on it, and when you look at the movie industry, right, um, it is a tale about the horrors of the inhuman. That's what I would say, right? The horrors of the inhuman. When really, the novel is about our incapacity to cope with the inhuman. Like that I'm convinced of, right? That it's a far more experimental novel about our inability to think other types of human being, right? And, and I think instead at the time and in the present it was read as more of a morality tale. I think one also shouldn't discount the fact that at the time it was originally read and it was by Mary Shelley, it was taken as a um, ghost story right, like a spooky story, right, um, whereas if one read Percy Shelley, right, there was a great, these were texts of great philosophical vision and import, right, um, whereas she just came up with a cool story one night, right, there's a recent, there have been like two or three film versions where that, you know, she was a great storyteller, she was not seen as like a, a philosopher thinking about what it is to be human, and I think that's, that's both in her time and now. I know, I know people um, in the UK who are sort of like Frankenstein specialists who every week are, you know, phoned up by TV stations and radio stations because it's the 200th, right? And they're asked like, um, to comment on the history of Frankenstein. And the usual, the, the usual problem is, of course, in the movie industry, Frankenstein is the monster, right? That, that, um, but that's seen as a way of, that's in what, it's true, Frankenstein is the monster, right? The scientist is the monster. Um, but I, 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 I think there's a sense in which Shelley wants to get rid of notions like the monstrous, the inhuman, right? She wants us to not say, that's inhuman, right? Or he's human, right? It's to, to, um, to get rid of that type of question, that you don't have to be human to be worthy of existence, right? Or recognised as human to be worthy of existence. 
Yes. Yeah. Right. Or good, good point. So, so can I, I'll, I'll repeat it if I've got the mic. Um, the question was the Anthropocenic. How does that apply today? Right. Scientific questions that are posed today. We're not creating. Well, I was going to say we're not creating humans in labs, but there's apparently uh, you can clone your dog for a certain fee. Um, just saying. Uh, I think the number one question, right, the Anthropocenic question that's close to this is geoengineering. So the, the passage I read, uh, Clive Hamilton's book, he was arguing against geoengineering, right, because he's saying, um, look at Frankenstein, you know, he, he, he was actually, and he actually uses Frankenstein as an example. You're going to try and fix the planet, right, because you messed it up, because the geoengineering example is, hey, if we've altered the Earth as a living system, then we could, right, there's, a, there's this uh, theory of the good Anthropocene. If we've altered it as a living system, then surely we have the power to change it. You also mentioned um, artificial intelligence. There is an institute, I... Please Google this, anyone who doesn't know it. There is an institute called the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. It is tasked with saving human intelligence. That means that, and directly makes this argument, we're focused on the wrong catastrophes. And one of the examples the director uses is the Holocaust. We think the Holocaust was a tragedy because a lot of people suffered, but if you look at it today, we've recovered. But what would be really tragic is if we lost intelligence, right? So if that means artificial intelligence, so the claim is it's not human beings that we value, it's intelligence we value, right? So I think, getting back to the sharper point about... Um, the Anthropocenic notion is it's because we're threatened, right, because we can imagine our non-existence that we're now saying, we've got to geoengineer, we've got to do artificial intelligence. So it's, not, it's no longer I think, therefore I am. It's like I might go extinct, therefore I must recreate something, right? And I think what you've got in uh, Shelley's Frankenstein is don't think that the task of science is at all costs, right? It must be either overstep the bounds to save yourself or don't overstep the bounds to save yourself. That's what, that's what she's critical of, right? And if you look at the debates over geoengineering, it's, well, well, we should do it to save ourselves. But what if it doesn't save us? That's the, I think the question needs to be posed, why are we so obsessed with saving things as they are, right? I'm not saying we should all like the ending of Frankenstein go off and say we're throwing ourselves on the funeral pile. I'm just saying as we are, right? So I'd say, yes, artificial intelligence, but probably the number one would be geoengineering, right, in the context of this, right? We've altered the earth, therefore it's our duty to alter it again, right? Yes. Oh, sorry, I, just this young fellow in the um. front. Not that you're not young. <laughs> Just young compared to me, young compared to me. Um, you emphasize the uh, part of the story that it's a frame narrative. Yes. And in many ways I read Frankenstein thinking about like her biographical context, like um, her relationship with Percy Shelley and I think, and I can't remember, her loss of children. Yes, um, okay. Or, in or what not. ways does her personal suffering and her inability to replicate Right. How are those ideas like imbued in the text? And furthermore, like, how did how did those like personal experiences she felt relate to your conclusion on her? Right. Uh, like, what you think the meaning of the text? Yeah. Is? So, um, using an author's biography to read a novel is not an unproblematic thing to do, right? So, there are other, t you know, that's I'll start with that, right? But. Um, 
if you look at it as an intellectual document of its time, right, and she's writing uh, at a time um, where one of the dominant political topics is abolition, right, which is those persons who have not been seen as human starting to be seen as human, right? So I think if we look at biography, I would say, yeah, you can look at the familial biography, but you have to also look at the intellectual biography and what it is to exist in Britain at that time, right, which is a time, of, which is a time in which what counts as human is very much at the fore, <laughs> right, in a, in a sense in which um, one of the things that's used throughout the novel is this woman is my property, right, when there were human beings who were property, <laughs> right, um, when there were human beings um, who weren't recognised as human, who weren't Right, who were monstrous and could be disposed of. I mean, literally thrown overboard if you were going to, um, if you didn't want to pay the insurance on a sinking. So, but getting back to your your question, I think the real biographical, um, if we're going to go hardcore biography into it, is one way to read Victor is he's like the romantic poets around her. Right, he there's also Clavel. Right, his his friend who studies, who's got this, who's and in the beginning, Walton says he wants to be a poet. He wants to be a great poet, and there's this notion that the poet sees into the life of things and is the grand Promethean visionary, right? And I think partly she's. It's. I think it's. I think it's a lot to do with, um, in the novel, different ways of thinking about the imagination, right? Because she was in a milieu of people thinking about how we look at nature is how we'll create and think about humanity. It's how we'll think about the future. And I think the novel is experimental in seeing Clerval, right, who is, is more into the humanities, right? Um, seeing the creature, seeing Victor, seeing Walton, seeing all these, um, seeing the Swiss family, right? So my, my take on the, even if we're talking about families, um, she had a, a, an authorial intellectual family around her and I think that's where she was putting her money, right? Um, and what it is, t and when she writes the novel, she refers to it as her monstrous offspring, right? So when she thinks of offspring, she tends to think of stuff you make, right, rather than babies you give birth to. At that, st I mean, at that stage that she's writing, I would say. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be a boring, uh, cliched feminist and not talk about women who write novels as compensation for not having babies. Right, I'm not. I'm not like that. I'm just saying that I. Th I genuinely think it's what she's exploring uh, forms of creativity that are monstrous, right? Including poems, right? That might do things. They might replicate and have. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Oh yes, you. You with the mic. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Colbrick. Um, my question is, um, in, under the Anthropocenic view. Um, what is the threshold for moral status? You had mentioned something about um, the harm principle. You had also mentioned something about intelligence. Yeah. Um, but I think it's kind of muddied where um, we should grant or not grant species. Sure. So um, I, the reason why I refer to the Future of Humanity Institute is because I'm horrified in the 21st century that something is consecrated that thinks that the future of humanity is the future of intelligence, and then in defines intelligence as a sort of Oxonian, Oxford, right, type, um, the form of intelligence that's not even, t like, l logic, techno, the techno-scientific inte intellect, um, that without that you don't have humanity, right? And, in fact, one of the... So I think the problem... I think the problem is thinking that there is... Ah, threshold, right? And um, it is interesting that when Shelley writes The Last Man, humans are gone and animals are flourishing and they're not killing each other. Now, 
I think the Anthropocenic, both the Anthropocenic problem that we're existing in the present and just um, if we take the point of view of the creature who's able to sort of look at human history from an outside, he sees it and his own life as one of part beauty, part destruction, right? And he, that's what he ends up becoming, right? So I think what's diagnosed is the idea that there is a good and pure and non-destructive humanity just lying in wait if only we kill off, right, the right, the monstrous, right? That, and I think if you look at post-apocalyptic culture and movies, right, there's a sense that you look around, oh, the world's about to end, but that's because of some evil, whether it's evil invaders or a certain vision of American capitalist militarist America, but if we could kill that off, we'd have the good humanity left over, which is always the end of the film. It can never be the beginning, right? Usually takes the form of the, the innocent family. Um, just did a sort of binge archive watch of end of world films going back to before climate change and uh, Independence Day has this, it ends with two couples, black, black, white, white, like Noah's Ark, right? But not, you don't mix them, right? That's not good. But the idea is that there is, there is a threshold of humanity, right? And there's a proper humanity. And I think the, uh, the challenge posed by Frankenstein is not that there isn't one, but that it can't be known, right? Um, and there's, there's something about knowing in advance or deciding in advance what counts as the human that that's definitely not only problematic but impossible right that's i think that's the importance of the frame narrative as well right we see that victor has no basis right for making those decisions other than his own family and his own kind right and um so yes i think i mean i genuinely think when we're in the anthropocene and we can see the damage we've done we can't decide in advance what counts as a life worth living. Um, that's not, that sort of managerialism um, is neither possible nor desirable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Um, can we give another round of applause to Professor Colbert? And and thank you for hanging. Thank you for hanging on. Like this is cool.